Hello, how are you guys doing? My name is Chris A. Matthews, and you are listening to the Marriage Underdog Radio Show. And once again, I have another phenomenal guest. And yes, you're right. It is a licensed marriage and family therapist. I want to introduce you all to Tanique Gentles, who is an adjunct faculty in the Masters of Marriage and Family Therapy program at Drexel University. And she's also a private practice owner of TAG Inspires. Tanique, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Chris. I'm excited. <laughs> definitely, definitely. We're going to have a great show for you guys. I always like to start, as you're aware, for those that have tuned in before, with an opportunity to learn more about how you got into this field, Tanique, because I believe we're called mm -hmm. into this work. It's not just something we do uh, for economical, economical gain. It's something you have to be brought into. How'd you get into the field? Honestly, Chris, so believe it or not, I wanted to be a mortician. <laughs> I wanted to be a mortician and I applied to go to Lincoln University to study psychology so that I can do forensic psychology. And then I hated science, didn't pass biology my first semester. It was just like, this is not it for me. So I thought about, okay, what else are you good with? And I was always good with like teenagers and kids and just talking to people, just a great listener as a child, as a teenager. So I decided to go with psychology and ended up graduating with a BS in psychology. And then I was dating someone at the time who um, was still at Lincoln. And I was like, I want to stay close. So I applied to go to Drexel in Philadelphia and they had a marriage and family therapy program. And I just really just went, it went from there. I got into the, the field, started working with kids. I worked with adolescents for about 10 years. First 10 years of my career, I worked with high-risk adolescents and their families. So I guess, and then someone reminded me the other day that I helped her when I was a teenager get out of a um, domestic violence relationship. And I didn't even remember that, but she found me on social media it was like, you know, I know that you've been called to do this work because you helped me get out of a relationship. Um, when you was a teenager, I was like 15 talking to her about this relationship. So I guess that's just always been my calling. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's evident by the people you helped. And I, lo I love that you were brought into this field by way of working with families and adolescents. A lot of clinicians are brought into this industry through working with children. I know personally, I worked in the school system. I worked in uh, public health departments where I tailored to adolescents by way of a, a teen pregnancy prevention program. Mm -hmm. Now, our topic today, we're going to talk about why couples, more importantly, why intimate partners in particular lie within their relationships. So I find it <laughs> fascinating that you used to work with teenagers because if you're a parent or you work with teenagers, they lie. They lie mm -hmm. a lot, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that lying trickles on into adulthood. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you this question just to start out. <laughs> Talk about some of the specific reasons or content areas that you find that couples or partners lie about entering counseling with their spouse. Hmm, that's a great question. So what I think, what I see the most with couples, what they tend to lie about is their sexual needs and desires. Mm -hmm. um, I would say friends of the opposite sex, um, money, <laughs> when things change for them in the relationship um, and they don't feel comfortable talking about it for whatever reason, I feel like that are thing, those are things that, that people mainly lie about of course infidelity is on the top right nobody's going to be honest that they're cheating <laughs> so right. that's something that might come up too but those are the, the typical reasons um that I, the, the most prominent reasons i feel like people lie <laughs> that's a great solid list i can i can attest to that as well infidelity is usually top of the list infidelity is rooted in lying deceit dishonesty that's the core of infidelity in itself now you mentioned uh, just to kind of recap that you find that couples may lie about their sexual needs and desires mm -hmm. of the opposite sex money, and then changes within the relationship. Talk about where you find the origins of these lies usually come from. So where do they develop within the person? Because I don't believe personally that we seek to lie to hurt. I think sometimes most people seek to lie to prevent hurting the person, but it actually does more damage than good. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think it's a lack of safety. I think people don't feel safe enough, to be honest. I think there's some fear of rejection and fear of abandonment that is rooted in um, dishonesty. Um, you don't, you know, you don't know what the outcome is going to be, right? And if, and if you fear that the outcome is going to be greater <laughs> than you telling the truth, then you're not going to tell the truth. I don't think anyone intentionally lies. We do have some people that intentionally lie if you're dealing with an access to person, a personality disorder, something like that. But in general, I don't think people intentionally lie. I think there's a lack of safety. Um, and like I said, these themes of like fear, abandonment, rejection, that come up um, that make people just, you know, feel like they, they can't be honest about it. And especially in relationships too, I feel like if you're dealing with a partner, cause you know, people say, I want to hear the truth. You can tell me everything. You can tell me anything you want to tell you me. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> but you can't <laughs> handle the truth because when I told you the truth and when I tell you the truth, you go flip mode on me, right? Mm -hmm. And once you go flip mode, I don't feel comfortable talking about it no more. I'm gonna shut down. So we say we want honesty, but the reality is, can we handle it? Can we really handle honesty? Definitely. I want to go back to something you said. You mentioned two camps of lying. The first camp would be the one that we would expect, right? The partners who are attempting to sustain a level of safety, prevent rejection or abandonment. Mm -hmm. That second camp you mentioned is access to uh, personality disorders. Talk about some of the potential personality disorders. And before you do so, I don't want our listeners trying to play therapist and diagnose, right? <laughs> um, I believe more people follow into the first group, but I want to just differentiate the two groups by giving you an opportunity to list a little bit about some of those personality disorders. And then we'll spend more time in the first group because I believe that's more prevalent. Absolutely. So we know everyone talks about the narcissist on social media. <laughs> and I'm not talking about the social media narcissist. I'm talking about the textbook, actual diagnosed narcissistic personality disorder. Um, antisocial personality disorder are the two. Um, those are the main two when I think about it. Um, of course, you have some people that like have like a mood disorder, something like that, but that's not access to. But when I think about access to, I'm thinking about your narcissist. I'm thinking about the, your antisocial personality disorder person, um, possibly some borderline, uh, somebody that has borderline as well. Um, those are the ones that come to mind when I think about someone that just just lies, right? Like that their specialty is just lying. <laughs> And that's done with manipulation at the core. That's intentional. It's designed to evoke an outcome that they may seek with lying being a tool that's used, right? Absolutely. That's not an accidental. They're not trying to uh, prevent abandonment or rejection. They're using the lying to fuel other issues that are going on within themselves that then perpetuate into the relationship right mm -hmm. like That's so we want mm -hmm. yeah it's a tactic right we want to separate those liars from your traditional liar so talk about now the traditional liar and we're going to start with lack of safety so the person is lying in the relationship due to not feeling safe mm -hmm. so when you think about that it goes back to this, you know, we say we want the truth, but can we handle the truth, right? And if you're with someone who you know, first of all, has a hard time opening up in general, like like vulnerability is, is a struggle for them. It's a challenge for them. Mm -hmm. And they try to come to you and they try to be honest with you, but you shut them down or you become reactive or you're explosive or, you know, nothing they tell you, you ever believe. It creates, you know, um, it's unsafety for them. It's It's not safe because they don't feel like they have a partner they can be open and honest with. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a parent, <laughs> you know, if you was raised in a household where you got yelled at for expressing your feelings, you got yelled at for, you know, or you were, you know, neglected or, mm -hmm. or no one asked you how you felt or, you know, you were re rejected, whatever it is in your household growing up. I feel like that creates, you know, circumstances where you feel unsafe because when you have tried to express yourself, you were rejected for it. Or the fact that no one even asked you how you felt about anything, you don't feel safe. You don't feel like you'll have the outcome. You don't feel like anyone really cares to know the truth about what you're feeling. So you keep it to yourself or you lie about it. 
And because that's actually unfortunately, I'm sorry, but unfortunately, when you did tell the truth, there was negative consequences, right? right. So you just learned to just keep it to yourself. Oh, I got to lie about it. Because when I do, when I do tell my truth, no one hears me. And that could be lying by omission. Right. Yeah. So, so partners that ignore one another, it's, well, you didn't care to know anyway, so I just didn't say anything. Yeah. And then we get into this mind reading piece. So it's important to be openly expressive with your partner, but it's also equally important for the other partner to validate and to acknowledge that what your partner is saying means something to you. Because if they don't believe there's any meaning in what they're saying, they're going to stop talking. Mm -hmm. And then when you want them to talk to you about serious issues, at that point, they haven't practiced those expressive muscles of communicating so it can't really be an on-off switch. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you need to keep it on. And when your partner is communicating with you and you might want to, you know, ignore them or block them out, you're actually teaching them, hey, what you have to say isn't important. And, and I believe that this is rooted in family of origin. One of, one of the things that has shaped my, my background as a clinician and just as a human in general when I was younger, my father would always cut the radio down if we were in the car or mute or pause the TV or cut the TV completely off whenever I came to him with any type of statement or, or feelings. And that taught me that what I had to say was important. We can do that in our intimate relationships as well. I want to transition, and this may also bleed into the next one, rejection. Talk about why people lie out of fear of rejection and uh, fear of abandonment. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, again, it goes back to if you don't know what the outcome is going to be and you feel like the risk is greater than the outcome, you're going to lie. Like if I come out and I tell you the truth, let's say I'm I'm in, in, my, in a relationship, right? And I'm not having a sexually fulfilled life with my partner. <laughs> and I come to you and I say, hey, you know, like I'm just not happy sexually. I don't know how you're going to react to that, right? And if I'm someone that has dealt with abandonment before or I'm afraid of losing someone, I may think, you know what? If I go to my partner and tell them that I'm not enjoying sex, they're going to leave me, right? Because that has been my reality. People have left me. People have abandoned me when I try to tell my truth. So what am I going to do? I'm going to pretend like I'm happy. I'm going to lay in this bed. I'm going to do all the things. But and even when you ask, and that happens with couples. They'll ask, like, is it good? Am I enjoying it? And you'll, yeah, it's great. But it's not, right? But that fear of abandonment, it supersedes everything else, right? Because if I tell you the truth, you're going to leave me. <laughs> Why? Because people have always left me. So I'm not going to tell you the truth. I'm, it's, I'm too afraid. I'm too afraid of what the outcome is going to be. Wow. You're putting on a masterclass when it comes to why people lie because a lot of our clients or listeners are in counseling. And if you're listening to this and you're currently working with a therapist, it sounds like what I'm hearing you say, Tanik, is allow your partner the opportunity to hear a preface, right? So you may say before you even talk about the lack of fulfillment in sex, lead with what's happened the last time you were open with another partner. So you may say, hey, the last time I shared a concern with a partner pertaining to intimacy or anything of importance, they left me. Mm -hmm. And I want to be open with you, but I'm afraid that you may leave me if I share with you how I feel. Absolutely. At that point, you're setting the stage and you're walking into it. Mm -hmm. And that's being vulnerable in itself, right? Talk about some other strategies and techniques that couples can apply to create a safe space mm -hmm. that could prevent lying from having to occur. Mm -hmm. I think just having open conversation, open communication, open conversations. One of the things that I ask my couples to do, especially my couples that have children, is get your kids in bed by a certain time, right? So that you can have that hour to wind down, whether it is that you're going to watch TV, whether we just going to take 20 minutes out of this hour just to have an open conversation. Let's just talk about the day. Let's talk about how we're feeling. 
Um, whatever it is, do regular check-ins with your partner too. We don't have to wait until there's conflict or there's an issue to check in. You know, randomly walk up to your partner. How are you feeling about this relationship? Is there something that could be different? Could we be connected more? Could we be more intimate? You know, how are you feeling? Talk to me. So creating spaces and opportunity for there to be open communication and dialogue, I think is a very important way of just like having these conversations and being honest with each other and promoting honesty. And like you said, kind of like being vulnerable enough to say, hey, I'm the person that I struggle with talking. I struggle with opening up. I struggle with being honest because I've had these things happen in the past. So I need you to kind of hold my hand until I get better with this, right? <laughs> so let your part also let your partner know what your weaknesses are. Let your partner know wh what areas you're challenged in so that they can support you around that. And what we don't realize is that people are, you know, we, we look for validation. We look to be validated through our partners. We look to be validated through people. And if we, we're not feeling validated, we're not feeling supported, encouraged, unfortunately, you know, it, it doesn't provide a space for us to to authentically be ourselves and be honest all the time. <laughs> you, so you, you're spot on. And I just want to highlight, you just talked about creating an environment that can harness truth. And one of the things I talk about in my online courses and even in my book, I talk about there's an environment that's created for infidelity. When you think about a Petri dish, the Petri dish is designed to grow a specimen. It's designed to activate a, a, a production of a microorganism in order to put it underneath the microscope, right? Mm -hmm. So that environment can be created to produce higher levels of honesty. And one thing you said in particular for those that have children or even house guests in general, produce a ritual or routine that enables you and your partner to consistently have a space for dialogue to take place. So it doesn't have to feel like this overwhelming, oh my gosh, we have to have the talk, mm -hmm. right? Because if you have a natural environment nightly or based on schedules, I know my wife, when she worked third shift, our morning breakfast routine was that time and space. Mm -hmm. And integrate within that space, not just the talk, but that may be a time where you have a higher probability of initiating sex or intimacy. So mm -hmm. your partner doesn't see it as, this is the time that we go to the principal's office. This is the time where we create an environment for talking, having sex, laughing, planning, et cetera. Uh, and then you mentioned check-ins. Check-ins don't have to once again be always scheduled. It could be going up to your partner and just saying, hey, talk to me. Hey, are we good? And you can use number scales. You can say, hey, from one to 10, where are we at? Hey, I'm at a 10 right now. Yeah. You could use an emotional word. So there are a lot of different types of check-ins. But ultimately, what I'm hearing you say, Tanik, if you have the environment created where it's safe enough for your partner to express how they feel, that would reduce the chances they would lie to you. Absolutely. Now, also, as, as we as we get near the end, I want you to share how partners can repair. So imagine if someone's listening to this episode mm -hmm. and they've been that anxious partner who may not have created an environment for honesty, or they've been the partner that's lied mm -hmm. and they want to redeem themselves or create a safer environment now as they explore what they've done to hurt their partner, how does the liar regain trust mm -hmm. to be able uh, to preserve the relationship? Mm -hmm. I think it requires a lot of self-work. I think you need to do some introspection and figure out what led you to lying in the first place and work that out within yourself. What's coming up for you? What are your you know, wounds, abandonment wounds, rejection wounds, validation? What is it? that prevented you from being honest with your partner. I think you need to sit with that and think about that first. I think you need to be committed to yourself and committed to your partner. <laughs> and you need to ask yourself these hard questions. You know, do I really want to be in this relationship? You know, did I use this lie as a way out? Um, or did I use this lie because um, I just couldn't tell the truth? Like, what is it about? You know, questioning yourself. Really make sure that you're committed to yourself and you're committed to your partner. Then you have to be committed to the work. I think people don't realize that. Like 
repair work is a lot of work. When I'm working with couples who have experienced infidelity, they come in, they have about three, four sessions, and they want things to be better. We're talking about months before things are better. This is a huge impairment to your relationship. This is a huge breach of trust um, to your relationship. And you have to be committed to the amount of time it's going to take to get your partner back on board. You have to rebuild trust. You have to rebuild the relationship. And you also have to recognize the relationship is not going to be the same that it was prior to this breach of trust. You mm -hmm. know, we, we got to create a new relationship. It's going to mm -hmm. look different moving forward. Why is it going to look different? Because now we know how to talk. Now we know how to have effective communication. Now we know what our triggers are. Now we know why we weren't being honest. So we're going to approach the relationship differently moving forward. But you have to be committed to the work. You have to be willing to be committed to yourself, committed to your partner, committed to the amount of time it takes and be able to do the work. It's going to take a lot of work. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, I second that. It does take work. And that work goes beyond just the counseling. And that's why there are resources such as online programs, books, podcasts, like the one you're listening to, seminars, workshops. And the work should be lifetime. When you look at managing a diet, you don't do that one time. You have to do that every time you eat. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at managing physical health, you get your checkup routinely. You go to the gym routinely. You have to make sure that your relationship is managed the same way that other areas of your life are managed when it comes to sustaining health. Absolutely. So we're not just talking about relationships. We're talking about relationship health. Mm -hmm. And lying, like you said, Tanique, is going to alter or misconfigure the relationship. It's similar to having a glass of clear water and you drop some dye in that water. It's going to change the whole relationship. But the way we can cleanse that relationship without pouring that water out is adding more clean water in. So mm -hmm. over time, that dye may come back into a tent and then you keep adding clear water. You can get back to a new homeostasis but do know it's going to take time. But I find that couples will keep lying. So every oh, time yes. you lie, you're just starting back <laughs> over again. Oh, yes. Right? More, you know, more withdrawals than deposits. You want to make deposits. You don't want to make withdrawals. You keep lying, you're withdrawing from your love bank, right? <laughs> the more honest you are, you're depositing into your love bank. Absolutely. And, 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 minding, and, and minding the fact that it is like being on a trapeze rope, right? I, I use that analogy because... There's no net underneath. A lot mm -hmm. of times relationships fall and break because you've, you've worn out the elasticity of there being some type of support underneath or some net, right? It, it's at this point when you have couples that have lied consistently is all or nothing at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. you ran out of chances. You absolutely so, uh, <laughs> definitely. Man, th This was awesome. I know, I know we're at time for those that have been listening uh, Tanique, how can people get in contact with you? Uh, so share with us your, your information and also be in the show notes as well. Uh, any information you want people to know, any final statements, thoughts, and uh, we'll, we'll close out. Absolutely. So you can definitely find me on Instagram. I'm on Instagram. My handle is at tag your couples therapist. I also own a private practice here in Glenside, which is about five minutes outside of Philadelphia. My website is www.taginspires.org. You can Google me. I'm on psychology today, goodtherapy.org, therapy for black girls. <laughs> you can find me on most of the platforms. Um, but of course, you can always find me on Instagram. And you know what I would leave you with is definitely communicate with your partner. Provide opportunities for conversations to happen. The more that you can communicate, the more honest you can be with your partner, the healthier your relationship will be. Um, and it'll be easier. And and, and don't use technology. Right. <laughs> Stay away from the texting. Have face to face conversations. Wait till we're home. Wait till we're in an intimate space to have these healthy conversations. That's what I will leave you with. Love it, uh, Tanique. It's been a pleasure once again. You've provided us with so much valuable information. Uh, for those who have been listening, you've been tuned into the Marriage Underdogs Radio Show. Our episodes are dropping every Tuesday on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And I am your host, once again, Chris A. Matthews. Look forward to your comments, likes, and we'll bring you another episode next Tuesday.
Thanks.